start of another winter's day in Australia's second largest city, Melbourne. The dawn of an adventure for three young men seeking a change from the dull routine of city life. South to North, a journey never before attempted by motorcycle. As well as bikes heavily laden with personal gear, they will be accompanied by two friends in a four-wheel drive vehicle with essential film equipment to record the experience. To complete the trip in the four weeks they've spent vehicles, their riders and effective filmmaking. Wilson's Promontory, the southernmost tip of Australia, is the beginning of the journey that will take them from chilly Victoria to the tropic humidity of northern Australia. Situated in a national park, the promontory still retains the unspoiled beauty of virgin bush. To begin at the beginning, a rugged walk through rough terrain is necessary to glimpse the southern ocean before setting out to cover the 1,500 miles to the sea. southernmost tip of the Australian mainland, Southeast Point. The months of planning behind them, it's time to go. Don Whitehurst, Bob Carey, Fenton Rosewall, and the support crew, Ken Lucas and Ian Wilson. First objective, to cross the ski fields of the Australian Alps and into New South Wales. Melting snows feed these clear mountain streams, the home of many fine trout. And on the higher peaks, the heavier falls make a winter playground that attracts thousands of tourists every season. The long, winding, slippery roads to the ski resorts with below freezing temperatures mark the first challenge to riders and machines. Smiggin holes and nightlife in the Australian Alps. Oh, Lord, people, oh, one woman like you. 
I think the magic of being uh, cold, of being able to come out somewhere and come back warm. Well, it means that much that I waited 10 months to go skiing again, and today is the first day. It means girls, and girls switch me on. Um, I enjoy skiing, and the social life itself is, is um, very interesting. Basically, the social life, and secondly, the skiing. That's being very honest. <laughs> Just a method of blowing your mind. And you can do this when you get on your board take off down a mountainside. Oh, once I can take this, it's mine, you can take it. In the Kosciuszko National Park, the snow fields are among the largest in the world, covering an area comparable with the ski fields of Switzerland. Skiing is growing in popularity every year in Australia, and the accessibility of the ski resorts is weekend sport. The world's first ski club was formed at Kyandra in the National Park in 1860, where gold miners used skis to move around the diggings, as well as winter recreation. Today, the area has over 300 clubs, with a total of 15,000 members. National capital of Australia and the seat of the Commonwealth Parliament, established just over 50 years ago. The city's unusual design was the result of an international contest won by Chicago architect Walter Burley Griffin. All buildings in the area have been designed to blend into the original concept. Parliament House and the Prime Minister's residence. Cities of many different countries retain their own individual characters. The United States, South Africa. Although by day a city of tranquility, by night Canberra is a kaleidoscope of colour. towards the outback country of Australia, a harsh land where pioneers fought against tremendous odds to establish our heritage. North to historic Hill End. Built over a hundred years ago. 
literally stuck onto the side of the steep hills, solid wooden beams were laid at right angles and packed with rocks and earth. A hundred years later, it still provides the only link to the area. Hill End nestles on a ridge above the Turon River. Before the turn of the century, this was the scene of one of the richest gold strikes the world has seen. In the roaring days, this was a town of 10,000 hungry gold seekers swarming the countryside seeking their fortunes. Even now, the locals still find the odd nugget. Today, a town of a few hundred souls, Hill End resident Bill Lyle still recalls the boom days. Hill End uh, was really kicked off to a, a great population by the discovery of gold in quartz. This discovery was by a man named Adams who was chasing a horse and he'd followed this horse about two miles and each time he got to put his hand on the horse, the horse would jump away. So when he got on the point of Hawkins Hill, he finally did his block and picked up a stone to throw at the horse. And as he went to throw it, he said, gee, this stone's heavy, and he looked, and he had a lump of quartz with gold in it, and that's how Hawkins Hill was discovered. And uh, from that, Hawkins Hill really made Hill End. The quartz, in the days of the alluvial miners, uh, they were getting gold, but when they got gold out of the quartz, then it was really, the tons of gold started to come out then, and that really put Hill End in the boot. The world's largest single mass of gold was hewn out of the ground at Hawkins Hill near Hill End in 1872. Called the Byers and Halterman Nugget, it weighed 650 pounds. And on today's market, it would be valued at about $120,000. Like other gold fields in Australia, Hill End saw many fortunes made and lost. to its veins almost every nationality. Its gullies and gorges attracted professors, doctors, political refugees, freed slaves, actors and ex-convicts. All with that one objective, to find gold. But it didn't last. This is Hawkins Hill, once the richest quarter mile of land in the world. A town rich in memories of the past, hopefully prosperity, from tourists reliving our pioneering days.
further inland to northeast New South Wales. Three motorcyclists in the Australian outback at the mercy of the... But Kalgoora in central New South Wales has a special interest in the sun. Here, the CSIRO operate a radio heliograph, an instrument designed for fundamental studies of the solar atmosphere, and in particular, the great explosions of the sun. It is, in fact, a specialized form of radio telescope. Amateur of nearly two miles, there are 96 saucer-shaped aerials, each 45 feet across, all individually controlled so that they can follow the sun's path across the sky. At the end of the day's run, they automatically return to the east in readiness for the following day's observations. All the aerials are connected to the observatory building by open wire transmission, 100 miles of copper wire. Why are they so interested in the sun? It may not appear to have a practical day-to-day -day application, but the observations are providing the answers to many problems that space researchers and travelers could encounter. The brains of the instrument is a specially designed computer which helps to record more than 14,000 pictures every day. This spectacular sunburst was recorded in March 1969. Explosion that occurred on the invisible side of the sun. The burst gave rise to a shock front that emitted high energy protons. Rays. Australia is the driest continent in the world. But life-giving water has transformed great tracts of this outback into rich productive land. Irrigation has made Wee War in the Namoi Valley one of the largest cotton producing areas in the world. Californian Larry Davis. About nine years ago, my dad got interested in growing cotton in another part of the world because of restrictions in the U.S. And so he heard there was a need in Australia, he came down here and was very interested in it. Uh, two other men whom he knew in the States actually came down and grew the first crops of farmers by the name of Kaelin Hadley. Our land here went in the next year after the first crop, this one in the second year. This field is one of the first ones. It's been grown continuously in cotton ever since then. The area has grown from 65 acres originally up to its present size of thousands of acres. It'd be around 40,000 acres here now. And this over a period of about seven years. So it's been a rather tremendous growth. It's been a, a good area for growing cotton. It's about on the same parallel as our home in California. So that the weather is quite similar here. and. Uh, this area has actually surpassed where we came from in terms of production in California, where California for years held the record for the top production in, in, in the world, as a matter of fact. The uh, field where we're standing right now has been picked once. Cotton is usually picked twice. So the pickers will come through, uh, pick most of the cotton. They don't miss some of the green bows that uh, haven't opened yet, and they don't pick it very cleanly. There are little tags hanging out. The pickers will come back through again and pick this all, and it will be pretty clean. From here, the cotton is dumped from the pickers into the large trailers. Uh, the trailers then we pull by tractor into the cotton gins. There are gins scattered around through the countryside here at five different locations in our particular area. We haul the cotton into the gin where it's sucked out of the trailers and goes through the gin uh, automatically. Uh, under the control of the jenner, and there it's processed into the 500-pound bales from which it's shipped to the spinner. This is about as far as we take the cotton. From there on, it's up to the marketing people and the spinning people. From Wee War to the more arid regions of northern New South Wales. <laughs> morning and a thick fog hangs over the countryside. The opal fields of Australia, Lightning Ridge. This is the home of the black opal, the elusive black opal in the world, the only place in the world where it's found. 
And here we have an area of 1,700 square miles, about a mile and one third of this country actually worked. On this was estimated by a feasibility survey that $247 million come out of this country already worked. To get into the opal business, all you need is a miner's right and registration of a claim, which cost you $3.40 for the year. And you can start off with a pick and shovel, light of the candle, and you might be in for money, you never know, you can work and work and work and may not get it, you may cost a lot. Opal mining calls for a keen eye and a steady hand. Whether you're picking through tailings on top of the ground or working in cramped conditions hundreds of feet below the surface. Underground, deep in the heart of an opal mine. After the heat, dust and noise on the motorcycles, the stillness and cool of the tunnel is a welcome change. The brilliant colours of the black opal only appear when it is exposed to light. Hidden for thousands of years, discovery is only the beginning, as meticulous care is required to extract it from its resting place. A careless jab with a pick could shatter a precious find. Some residents at Lightning Ridge came for a holiday years ago. Each year, more than a million dollars worth of black opal is mined at Lightning Ridge, and it meets a keen demand, both in Australia and overseas. season, Lightning Ridge swelters in above century temperatures. But a sudden deluge turns the dirt roads into black, clinging mud. It makes riding for the inexperienced difficult and progress is slow. Lapse of concentration and the slippery corrugated track lands one of the team off the road and 60 feet from his bike. Shaken, Fenton Rosehorn seems to have fared better than the machine, but both continue the journey that is becoming more grueling than expected. From New South Wales into the northern state of Queensland. A cairn is built to mark the halfway point of the crossing. Behind them, some 1,300 miles. Ahead, some of the toughest country in Australia. central Queensland is in an area rich in pioneering history. The town of just over 1,500 people lies in the middle of beef cattle country. Now an isolated town, but many of the buildings dating back to the turn of the century hint of an earlier grandeur and importance.
The Yiri country is complemented by the strange sound from the territory's only telephone line. Communications engineers call it Aeolian reverberation, after Aeolus, the Greek god of the winds, and is created through wind and vibration. A drought like this one could last years. Nothing grows. Farmers are driven off the land, but only after they've seen their stock and future die before their eyes. But this country has seen some good years. Years when the land was a mass of green, life-giving grass. When stock flourished, and the only problems farmers faced were the decreasing wool prices. And still the merciless sun beats down. Dagworth Station, this bush of Bougainvillea adds a bright touch to a landscape otherwise burnt dry. The homestead is much like any other in northern Queensland, isolated, and with their closest neighbours hundreds of miles away. This is beef country, but so harsh is the drought that no cattle have been on this property for eight years. Years ago, when the seasons were better, Dagworth paid host to balladeer Banjo Patterson, who, while staying here, wrote a song that was to become synonymous with the outback. trip north continues through this isolated country to rugged Cape York Peninsula. This place sets its own rules tropical region with rivers and creeks that wind their way through the jungles in an endless parade, with a beauty all of its own. The few bridges across the waterways are solid, made to cope with the monsoonal moods of the rivers. This was the domain of the Aborigine. For years, the Cape York Aborigines, among the most warlike in Australia, fought to block the intrusion by white man. But today, the Aborigines are adapting to the ways of their former enemy. is full of reminders of the past and here at Split Rock Cave is one of several Aboriginal art galleries that have been discovered in recent years. These drawings painted with natural ochres and charcoal have long outlived their creators.
York is full of surprises. And when you travel on the peninsula, you must be prepared for everything. This is the main street of Laura, one of the larger settlements. With the hot climate, whether it's for a beer or the latest hairstyle. The locals don't believe that the expedition members are serious about taking the motorcycles to the top of the Cape. You get through the Jardine, you got my deeper sympathy, I tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, seen it, I've seen it in the wet season when it blows through. Yeah, yeah, the water may be able to put deep as the bloody quicksand under it. But it will never be able to ride those horses over the road tonight. <laughs> Anything at all that can break the monotony is clutched at enthusiastically by the locals. A once a year carnival provides a temporary respite from boredom. But for these people who are born and raised with horses, there is one thing better than a carnival ride, a race meeting. There's only one race meeting a year at Laura and it lasts two days. With only a month to go, horses have to be trained to run in a circle. Most horses here have never been raced and are only used for riding the seemingly never-ending boundaries of the cattle stations. Ever northward, the track leads to the coastal settlement of Weeper. Men and machines of the expedition are being pushed to the extreme by the rugged and tough terrain. Dust has been plaguing them for most of the journey, but now sand is the problem. Termite mounds, containing a labyrinth of passages, cells and storerooms for these tiny creatures who live on grass and wood. The thick outer shell protects them from the sun, but the mounds always point north and south to catch the sun's warmth. only about 12 degrees below the equator. Huge trucks trundle over the red pebbles that spell enormous wealth to Weeper. They're here because of bauxite. Aluminium is made. Tests have shown that Weeper has the largest reserves of bauxite in the world. Conservatively estimated at 516 million long tons. But there could be a lot more. Some tests a little farther afield have shown that the total bauxite deposit in the area could be more than 2,000 million tonnes.
timber and overburden have been removed, it is mined direct from the face of the land. The payloaders dump eight cubic yards of bauxite into aluminium-bodied trucks, which have a 70-ton capacity. It is then transported to an elevated dump station. This huge plant, which treats, grades and washes the bauxite at the rate of 1,000 tonnes an hour, operates 24 hours a day. The stockpiled bauxite is reclaimed by air chutes, which operate in a tunnel beneath the stockpile. It then travels by conveyor to the loading wharf. Ships pull in at the modern port of Weeper in a never-ending stream to load the treated product. It's delivered to the refineries of Japan, Europe, and round the coast to Gladstone in Queensland, where it's smelted and processed into aluminium. Above five million tonnes of bauxite is produced at Weeper each year. The last stage, the track to the top. The expedition finds that the peninsula is continually cut by river after river. They have to take each one as they come, crossing and recrossing them on their way to the top. You don't meet many people this far north on the track, but it's reassuring to know that there are others around to help in an emergency. The theory this time was that the tree could be used with a block and tackle to enable the four-wheel drive vehicle to be towed out. Their last major barrier, the big one, the Jardine River. In the wet season, this river can be up to a mile wide and 40 feet deep. But this is the dry season and should make it possible for an easy crossing. When you're stuck in the middle of one of the most temperamental rivers in Australia, you need a friend, especially one with a four-wheel drive vehicle. And then when you're both stuck in the middle and the water is rising and the current getting stronger, it seems too much to expect help to arrive. Unfortunately, it only adds to the problem initially. Its brakes fail and it rams the expedition's vehicle.
takes a lot of pushing, pulling, lifting, and a sense of humor to get the expedition's small vehicle out of the hole it has dug for itself in the soft mud. But then I'm not sure yet, because there was... No chances are taken with the motorcycles. They're carefully wheeled across, then stripped and cleaned. It takes the five members of the team more than eight hours to make this one crossing. The final stretch to Cape York. On the way, they pass through Bamaga, a mission settlement for Torres Strait Islanders. Over centuries, the heat and humidity of this region have tempered these people's way of life, and their pace has adapted to the climate. covered without any shelter from the searing heat. Growth in this monsoonal area is so lush that the vegetation completely blocks the sky and threatens to engulf the road. This is Somerset, where the first cattle station on Cape York Peninsula was established by the Jardine family in the 1860s. The settlement now is only one house, occupied by a Torres Strait Islander and his daughter. Built on the cliffs overlooking Albany Island and the Japanese pearling station, one of the few remaining of what was once a thriving industry in the Gulf of Carpentaria. A beautiful beach, a welcome relief from the dense jungle. The Cape acted as a magnet to early explorers. The jungle crowds in around the memorial to one of them, Edward Kennedy, who braved the elements and the natives in 1848 in an attempt to blaze a trail from Rockingham Bay to Cape York. He didn't make it. He was killed by natives while on the last stage. Another pioneer, Frank Lascelles Jardine, who with his brother Alexander drove 250 head of cattle overland in 1864 to establish the Cape's first station. He lived on the station until his death in 1919, where at his own request he was buried standing and facing the sea. the last day. Tomorrow will bring the last of the rivers, of the choking dust, the searing sun, and that final search for the objective, the northernmost point of the Australian mainland. began with the cyclists relatively inexperienced. But three and a half thousand miles through extremely varying conditions has improved their ability to handle the bikes, and with only 25 miles to go, they handle the track with ease.
began on southeast point, Wilson's Promontory. Now it ends on another rugged point as they gaze out to the islands of York and Iberac. Cape York Peninsula, 3,500 miles through dust, mud, snow, and over 90 rivers crossed to a beach at the top of Australia. Thank <laughs> you. 